Good morning, everybody. So this is about controlling multiple Azure tenants with Microsoft 365 DSC and uh, Azure pipelines. Uh, who of you have already seen the follow-along session about the DSC workshop? Uh, you or no? Okay, the rest not, because it's a little bit recycling of the slides. We are recycling the same concept. This, for some, it could be a bit boring. So, um, I don't like this presenter view, but anyway, I have to deal with that. Uh, yeah, as always, thanks to our sponsors. Without them, it wouldn't be possible to have this conference. Some words about uh, myself. Yeah, I'm Raymond with Microsoft since 2002 and um, pretty active in the open source community project since quite a long time. So I started NTFS Security and Automated Lab in, I don't really know, 2010 maybe. And um, since then, I'm also active in the DSC space. So participating in the development of the DSC workshop, various DSC resources, and since last year, also the Microsoft 365 DSC workshop. Passionate about everything around PowerShell and DSC, and in my free time, as you have, would have seen um, regarding the photos, I'm trying to explore the world and do some trekking and mountaineering. Good. So where do we come from? It's a bit tough to compress the content into half an hour, so I guess the Q&A will be a little bit shorter. We'll see how this works out. So we came from Gail Kola's DSC InfraSample, which was a project that is mainly focused on managing on-prem infrastructure using DSC with a new way of managing configuration data. Those of you who know DSC a bit more, you have just one massive hash table, and this hash table is the configuration data for DSC to work. And to build up this hash table and to maintain the configuration data is a very complex task, especially if you have... Um, like in group policy or like we used to have in the op space for a long time, a kind of hierarchical configuration model, like all the servers should have the same baseline, right? On top of that, you have maybe differences between various locations. On top of the locations, you have maybe an environment like dev, test, and prod, because of course we don't want to use the same credentials in dev than we want to use in prod. And so you have this hierarchy of things. The more you are down in the hierarchy, the more we are talking about cattle, everything is the same. The more we go up the hierarchy, up to the individual computer, to the individual server, we have pets. And we want to, of course, act more on the cattle sides to have everything the same. So this was the initial idea. Then we extended this in the DSC workshop that we started in uh, 2018. So we joined forces into one big project. Um, then, of course, we are in a cloud age. We added some support for Azure Automation DSC in 2019. And um, this year, we have also added support for Azure Guest Configuration. So when Guest Configuration is feature complete, then uh, this workshop or this template can also be used to have your config there. And last year, more and more customers approached us asking, how can we synchronize our Azure tenants? Right? You have you start with one Azure tenant and then you face the same problem like in your old Active Directory world. You need an, a test Active Directory. And um, even before, you need a dev Active Directory. And then maybe you have a long-running project that needs its own playground, its own um, lab environment. And so some customers have a handful of tenants, some even 15, 20 tenants. And the question is, how do we control these tenants? How do we make sure that whatever we do in the test tenant has a meaning in the production tenant? How do we make sure that they are not completely um, out of sync in terms of configuration? Right, And um, the only way of doing that are DevOps principles, as we know, and some infrastructure as code approach, because just uh, pushing people around and forcing them to document the changes, as we know, does not work. Yeah, So we try to kind of combine or, or use the same principles that have proven already in the on-prem world and use it for Azure automation and uh, Azure tenants. Um, if you are more interested in the background of this, the evergreen white paper, um, the release pipeline model written by Stephen Moraski and Michael Green a long time ago in 2016 is still very up to date and most customers unfortunately still don't really implement the ideas of having a release pipeline for managing also infrastructure. Good. So why do we do that? Um, very important statement, any improvement not of the constraint is an illusion. So we need to really tackle the problem. And tackling the problem is us. We are the problem. We are humans and we do mistakes. So we want to have a process that is really making sure that whatever we want to be live in our environments um, is actually what we expect. And therefore, automation comes into place, right? We need to have a solution that is tackling these problems or needs to have these attributes like adaptability, predictability, reliability, 
Um, and to save a little bit of time, let me move forward to this slide here. Yeah. So uh, usually what we do is the, the upper line. We are doing a change. We are going with a change into the test environment and we are making sure, or first in our dev environment, making sure that the idea actually works. If it works, we are adding some little trust bits to our, to our activity. And then we move to the test environment. And we want to see if it still works in the test environment, hoping that dev and test environments actually match a little bit. And then we have another trust bit that we add to our change. Then we go to, to our change board, management board, whatever. We present the change, say, okay, we have tested the change. Let's do it in production. And uh, then you may have an evening last than, like the last one. You had a couple of too many beers and the evening was too long. And the next morning you have to do your change, but you do it slightly different than planned because your head is not working as expected. And uh, then you have a perfectly documented change. You have tested the change, but you are not implementing it in the way you should do, right? And then all these procedures have been in vain because you haven't worked as expected. And what we try to do in this whole model is learning from the software industry. Because if we are downloading Notepad++ or any other software, we are downloading an artifact, something that is tested and has a version number, right? And regardless where we use this, this artifact, it will be always the same. And this is what we are trying to do in this release pipeline model and in the DSC approach. We are creating a package that contains all the changes that we want to do to an environment. And then we are testing exactly that package, this artifact, this immutable artifact in the dev environment. And if it works there, then we take the same artifact and apply it to the test environment. And if it works there, then we take the same artifact and go to the prod environment. That means that you can, you have the guarantee that over the flow through your environments, you have the exact same change and you're not going to have a different result as expected, right? And um, this is actually what's behind the term artifact, right? We have a unit of work or a unit of, of something created by us. It's versioned, very important. We have need to have automatic versioning so that we cannot mess with the versions. And the most important thing is, of course, tested and immutable. An artifact does not make sense if you have produced it, stored it on a file server, and somebody changes bits in the artifact without reflecting this in the version number and um, in the change log, right? So these artifacts are actually the, the, the magic that we use, or the concept of artifacts to make sure that our changes are actually applied to the individual tenants. Good. Uh, Build dependencies. No, let's go right into a demo. So, how many how many tenants do you control in your business environment? Just to get an, a rough idea. Standard three. Standard three. So the dev test prod, right? Okay. Anyone more or less? Depends. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so roughly the same idea, yeah. So what we have here now is um, this approach. Oh, first of all, you may have heard about this project here, which is uh, the Microsoft 365 DSC project, just a number of, of a lot of DSC resources that can manage a lot of artifacts within Azure. And uh, now I lost the focus because of the Zoom, but there should be... Here is the menu, resources, and let's, okay. Obviously this page is not designed to <laughs> be displayed in a, yeah. at least you can, you can get, get a glimpse about all the available resources here for Active Directory, for group settings, um, conditional access policy, users, groups, but user and groups are not primarily the target of this um, idea here. Then we have Exchange, we have Teams, we have SharePoint Online, so we can manage almost everything in, in an M365 tenant and uh, in Azure Active Directory using DSC using code, right? And um, the idea that we had is um, as follows. Where is it? Here. So we have a code repository. The code repository is in Azure DevOps or in GitHub, wherever you want. And 
there is no change that you do to an Azure tenant using the portal or using scripts or any other means, right? Changes will be only done in the configuration database. And we will have a look at the configuration database in a minute. Um, if you do a change to the database, then you have a continuous integration trigger. That means every change is triggering a build process. And every build process is creating an artifact. And this artifact is then promoted through the environments to reflect the change. And let's do one change so that we can hopefully see the result in uh, after, to after the talk. And this is how it looks like if we have a look at, for example, groups. As I said, groups are not primarily well for managing through this solution, but for a demo it's quite easy. And here we go. Here we have our groups. So in our dev tenant, I hope the font is okay. In our dev tenant, we have um, test group one and two and three, but three is set to absent, so it should not be there, right? And if we have a look at our portal um, in the dev tenant, which is Contoso one, and then we go to Active Directory. Sorry for the dark mode, but we only want to check the groups that are available here. We see there is test group. No. All groups. We see there is test group one, 102. That's it. Um, actually, in the, in the, in the configuration data, we have seen only one, two, and the absent group of three. So where is the group 100 coming from? We'll see in a minute. So let's set this to present. Store this. And then we go to our git change control. We see the very little difference down here. Difference. Um, put group to active. Commit the change. Usually, we know, we manage a change log and be a little bit more expressive about the change. But in this case, it's fine. And then we are synchronizing the change, pushing it to our repository. And if we have a look at our pros project on Azure DevOps, we see there are three workers. Um, each worker is attached with a managed identity with a relevant tenant. So we have a managed identity that has the permission to do whatever we need to do. Um, we try to use the least admin privilege model, but usually over the time, this, this account has to do such a, uh, such a big workload, so many scopes that actually you have in de facto global admin. And um, so each of these workers is connected to one agent, and we should also see that the agents are picking up the job. I was hoping to. Uh, okay, something works. Uh, here we see we have now three build environments, or we are do clicking off the build for all the three build environments, and then we would test or configure our dev, uh, dev tenant, then we would test the dev tenant, and if this succeeded, then we're moving forward to test and finally to prod. But as far as remember, we have a gate for the prod environment, which means we get a manual request if we really want to push the change to the prod environment, because doing this without human intervention might be a little bit risky, right? So the, the design is that we are moving the change to our release pipeline. The release pipeline builds the artifacts, using um, the, the build engine that we have. And each build worker has the permission to access the Azure tenant and is not only creating the build, but also enacting the configuration. So if you have worked with DSC a little bit, um, this is not only the build engine, but also the LCM, the local configuration manager that actually enacts the configuration and puts it to the tenants. Which means in a couple of minutes, we will see that the group is being created automatically without any manual um, intervention at least in diff and test, right? Um, so what we have seen is there are three groups already created, test one, two, and 100. Where is the group 100 coming from? And um, so the configuration model looks like this. We have, and this is, of course, something that is different for each individual environment and custom environment, we have a configuration that is applicable for all tenants because we want to keep tenants in sync, right? Our dev, test, and prod should be as much the same as possible. But of course, there are differences. Especially for the dev tenant, you don't want to enforce all the security settings, right? And therefore, be a little bit more comfortable regarding the work. So that means we need to have a kind of model that allows us to do settings for 
all the machines, uh, all the all the tenants, and then be a bit more specific on the tenant level. And this is what we do here. Here we have a um, AAD group file that is defining only the group 100. That means all the tenants get this group created, or all these tenants would get a certain conditional access policy created, or whatever, right? Don't focus too much on the resource, more on the, on the principles and process. So you can define what all your tenants should have. And then if we go to an individual tenant, like our dev environment, we can say, okay, we want to have these additional groups. Or we want to have a group kicked out, right? For example, you have a set of conditional access policies, but for the dev environment, let's be a bit more relaxed. Let's remove a set of conditional access policies to get people going and um, e easy to work in the dev environment. So we have a, a merging model, and the merging model looks like this. All right, so we start with um, our base configuration for all tenants, and um, then we look into our environment. So we have a, yeah for the, for the environment. Then we go all tenants for Exchange, environment for Exchange, all tenants for Azure, and then environment for Azure. So you have a kind of layering hierarchy. And we always get to the all tenants first and then to the environment. Of course, you can add layers here. If you are having a little bit more complex model, we are not limited to this number of layers, but we can add them, remove them. It's completely um, flexible. So we have customers that have about 150 layers, which makes it pretty tough to work with, a little bit uh, hard to get an overview. And uh, some have only the most basic stuff like this one. All right, so at the end, all this data is merged. And um, I think group policies are pretty well known, I guess, to everybody, right? Pretty old technology. And if we think about group policy, um, at the very beginning of group policy, there was no resultant set of policy. That means if you had a problem with a specific computer not getting all the policies, you manually had to go through all the OUs to identify the policy that might be missing or has the wrong information. And in 2003, Microsoft added the concept of resultant set of policies, which is give me the view of all the policies from a from a computer's perspective, right? So go through all the OU hierarchies and merge the stuff together. And this is what we have also in our build output because what happens currently in, um, in the build pipeline is exactly what I can kick off here with the script build.ps1. The build.ps1 file, um, first of all, cleans my output folder, which is this one. Um, then it creates the RSOP information, which looks like... This, right, and here we have a full-blown view to our configuration now. Right, and here we'll also see, yeah, some exchange settings, group role settings. And here are the groups. Group 1, 2, 3, plus 100. So this is now the full-blown view, taking all the information from all the levels, doing the merge, doing the knockouts, and whatever is configured, and is the easy or the best way of troubleshooting if the output or if the configuration is not exactly as expected, then you should see the mismatches exactly in here. Right? Good. Let's see, what is it doing here? This is still building, this will take some time. Good. Um, we also support if managed identities are not the way to go. Where is my slide? Here. Um, in this case, as I mentioned, each, each environment needs one worker, right? So if you have a fourth environment, we would need to have a fourth build agent. And if managed identities are for some reason not the right tool, then we still uh, also support um, certificate authentication. And um, then we would, of course, need some Azure Vault for storing the certificates, getting credentials. This is also an option. But we found that um, managed identities are, of course, much easier because no authentication is required. You can simply be very transparent regarding this. OK. Any questions so far? If you see, I mean, it's, it's, it's very brief because in half an hour, it's very hard to, 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 to show this. But any questions so far? But, but what? That depends on the workload that you want to do. So um, in, I'm not sure if I'm uh, able to show that, but let's, oh yeah, thank you. The question is, what 
roles does the managed identity require? So we are working with app permissions, uh, API permissions, um, but for some resources it wasn't enough and we had to go with some certain roles. And uh, let's have a look if this specific command that works. Is it, I need to see, is it in lab? Is it in, I think it's in lab. Yeah, we have the AZ helpers, um, IPMO AZ helpers. <laughs> Get M365 DSC compilation list 2. Right. So this is a commandlet that gives you all the permissions required to do whatever workload you want to do. And you see it takes a while because it needs a lot of permissions to, to scan. And here we go. So if you, for example, want to deal with Teams, um, then we need that permission if we want to deal with Active Directory and so on. So what we do is um, we expect that a user or that in this demo you want to manage everything. So what we do is we take this list and we apply the list on the identity of your of your choice. And then you can do literally everything, right? Um, so the answer to the question is really, it depends on what you want to manage. If you're just up for exchange, of course, then you need less permissions as if you want to do the whole package, right? Any other questions? Where does the morph compilation occur? Exactly. Good. So the question is, where does the morph compilation occur? And this actually occurs in the, in the build pipeline. So, all right, finished. And if we go to the first step, the build pipeline, then we do exactly this. And we should have seen this already. Can we kind of give this a bit more space? That's hard. Um, I hope I hope it's readable also from the back end. So this output here, starting with init, cleaning the build output folder, is exactly the same output that we have seen in Visual Studio Code, right? If we do it again, build. Here. So this is exactly the same output. So what happens is we have a build engine that is configurable using the build YAML down here. And um, I repeat a little bit of what we talked about in the, in the DSC workshop yesterday. So usually if you have a project that runs on Jenkins or on Azure DevOps or on, on GitHub Actions and you want to move it to a different organization that is using a different technology, then it's always quite hard because you need to reinvent the pipeline, right? The pipeline is not product agnostic. So what we try to do is not use Azure DevOps too much or GitHub Actions, but rather put all our activities in PowerShell, because PowerShell is the language that actually can run everywhere and can do everything. Um, so we need to have a PowerShell workflow engine. And there is, for example, Pisaki is one. The other one is Invoke Build. And these engines let you allow or let you define tasks and also dependency between tasks. So for example, here we have um, tasks, a task for Azure init. Because what we need to do first is, actually I'm not sure what are we doing in this task. I need to set some certain build parameters. So this is something that needs to happen very early in the build job. And another task is um, this one here, start the DSC configuration and test the DSC configuration. Okay, so Task definitions are pretty much like function definitions. So the question is, where do we call these functions? And where do we make the order? And this happens down here. The build YAML says, if we start a build, the first thing we do is we do some initialization, whatever that is. Um, then we clean the build output folder. Pretty important, right? The, the worst thing you can have is if you would merge some old and newer build artifacts and you cannot really trust how your folder looks like, right? So scrap it first. Um, then we create, it's more or less a dummy task, so it's not important. Then we do the Azure init. Then we're loading our configuration data. These, this is the YAML files, right? Reading the YAML files and converting the YAML files into this massive hash table that DSC usually requires and that human beings don't really well understand because it's simply too much. So we need some tooling around that. Then we are testing the configuration data. Something very important in the, in the whole DevOps space, right? Um, one principle of DevOps is fail fast. If we have a problem, we want to see it immediately. 
at best in the dev environment, right? The worst case is ignoring a failure in dev test and move it forward to prod. So this is why we have some config data test. We, we can't test everything here, of course, but we can at least test if things make sense. And if you, f if you introduce a bug, if you introduce an error that you don't want to introduce a second time, then what do you do? You write a test. You make sure that you're not hitting this problem another time because it maybe cost you some outages. Therefore, write a test to give it the next time. Then we create our RSOP. This is the merging into these files that we have just seen to get this troubleshooting idea. Um, then some that is very DSC related, the PS module path. So P DSC is very picky with the PS module path. That this is why we are cleaning it up here a little bit. Then we are making sure that we have all the necessary resources to compile the stuff, and then we do the compilation of the MOF files, and also the meta MOF files, which are not required here, right? And that's it actually. And because the LCM and the build worker are working on the same machine, um, we don't need a pull server, we don't need Azure Guest configuration, we don't need any infrastructure. We just create the MOF files on one particular build agent and we enact it so the build agent then con contacts um, the Azure DevOps machine. Right? So that means if the build is finished, this is the output folder. There are my MOF files separated um, between all the available environments. And of course, MOF files are not very nice to read, but they are pretty transparent, so we don't, we don't even need to open them, right? We just trust that DSC did the right job and put the right information into the MOF file. Good. Any other questions about this process so far? Otherwise, just to give you an idea what's happening, um, the, the whole idea is built on a project called Datum, um, created by the gentleman Gail Kohlers, who was organizing the conference here. And um, if you want to get a little bit more a feeling of what's, what's happening with the YAML files, we can do something like, first of all, let's have a look into our source structure. All right. Uh, no. Dear. Here we go. Here we go. We have these kind of layers. And what we can do is we can create um, the hash tables in the background manually by using a new datum structure and point to the definition file, which is the datum YAML. And what we get is a, a, an array of hash tables which is reflecting the folder structure, right? So here we have, for example, our all tenants configuration. So we go to $d dot count fixed. No, does IntelliSense work? Yeah, here we go. Okay, what do we have here? We have Azure AD base and exchange. So we can go to Azure AD. Here we have the configuration for all these things, like our Active Directory groups, CAAD group, and here we have items, and here we go. Here is at least the, the, the single group that was defined on the all tenants level. When we go here and replace this with the environment layer, then we have nothing. That's good. Um, what's happening here? Oh, oh, yeah, I did something wrong. Two Azure AD groups. Sometimes IntelliSense is your enemy. <laughs> ah. Here we go. And then we go to Dev, then we go to Azure AD, then we go to CAAD groups. And then we have the items, and here we go. Yeah. Don't get confused by this. Normally, you don't need to even do this, right? You just deal with the YAML files. YAML files are getting converted to a hash table. The hash table is then transferred to DSC. DSC creates the MOF file, all done, right? So usually, you only have to deal with that if something goes utterly wrong and you have no idea why some certain piece of data is missing. Um, and if you don't really understand why it's missing, even if you have checked all the, the stuff, then you open an issue uh, either there in Datum or in the DSC workshop project to get an idea about what's, what's, what, the, what the main issue is, right? So let's have a look at the build pipeline. Finally, it should have proceeded. Oh, it failed. 
That's bad. Uh, ah, the test DSC configuration in dev failed. The uh, enacting obviously worked. Deployment worked for some reason and the test failed. Yeah, there is the deployment task. Um, again, we use the same build engine for enacting the changes in the tenants. So the output looks pretty familiar. But now we are calling the start DSC configuration task. The start DSC configuration task does, just uses the LCM to put the changes into action. And if we go back to our groups and do a refresh, and we should see one more group appearing here. No, we don't. That's interesting. What did I do wrong? It, it should have happened, <laughs> right? Um, let's have a look at where group three is to get an idea about group two, group three. Set. And we are in the dev tenant, right? So let me go back. I am in, in the dev tenant. Yeah, I did do all right. Did we have a refresh problem here? No, obviously not. That's interesting. I need to troubleshoot, but I don't want to do the troubleshooting just in front of you, right? So just, just suppose it has worked. So it worked in, in all my tests previously, even yesterday evening before the dinner. So no idea what have went wrong this time, but yeah, please. Do we see an error message? Oh, yeah. But why? Maybe it is still in the recycle bin? Yeah, but I mean, it, 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 I just deleted it. And so what happens if the group is still available in here? Is that maybe causing the problem? So if you delete it permanently... Okay, permanently deleted, and then we restart that particular task. We're on failed job. But anyway, it's also a good example. What we've seen that something went wrong in our dev environment, and then we are stopping, right? So we are enacting the configuration, we are testing the configuration, and if things do not work as expected, then we get an email. We get a notification, and then we can do the troubleshooting and start from scratch. Something similar that we did now. I mean, this is a very easy use case, so simple, easy troubleshooting steps. And uh, let's see if this works a little bit better now, right? Good. Any other questions so far? So why would you assign this machine to an automation account? Do you mean Azure, Azure DSC automation, right? Um, okay, I think, now that I think, I know if this breaks. Yes, because an Azure automation account um, is configuring the LCM in pull, right? Uh, what you could, of course, do is, but I, I think that's not the right way. You can just use pull. Right, so if you, what do you do with the build agents? Do you configure the build agents using Azure DSC? Okay, so in this case, you could, uh, how complex is the configuration that you have for the build agents? Okay, so in this case, you need to kind of merge what we have here. So this model allows you, of course, also to configure the machine and additionally, um, the, um, the Azure settings. But, but in fact, I would, I would treat these workers very special because these workers are having the control about your Azure tenants, right? And I don't want to treat them as normal build workers for whatever project you, you do. So usually these build workers are controlled by the tier zero tenant, whatever admins, right? And nobody should mess with them because if somebody gets hands on these machines, then you're pretty much lost, right? And uh, let's see, something better now? No, obviously. Job pending. Ah. No. Group 3 is failing. So something something is wrong with the creation. But um, 
yeah, it definitely worked. <laughs> so, so this is the, this is actually the, the the concept that you can fire and forget, right? You do your changes in your configuration data. Um, the pipeline is kicked off, and then actually you can go home. And then the next morning, you either have a green email or a red email. In this case, a red email telling you that something is not working as expected. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's actually the whole concept. It is much more complex than you think it is, right? So the whole model has evolved over the couple of five years, in the last five years. Um, but on the other hand, it gives you a tooling that makes DSC in this scope, but also in many other scopes, a kind of framework or even a solution and not only a technological platform. Because DSC, as it is documented, is usually not scaling. And I know some gentlemen here that face the same problem and uh, create their own solution to make DSC much more flexible and scalable for large environments, right? And um, yeah, and this model can be, of course, used for multiple things. For example, Jan Hendrik Peters is going to do a talk about configuring app locker policies with this concept because. Um, I'm not much into AppLogger, but obviously you ha have to control a number of applications, maybe hundreds of applications that you want to allow or not allow and how PowerShell con should be configured. And usually group policies are configured and controlled manually, right? Maybe you have the AGPM for some versioning, but it's a manual task. There are no DevOps principles behind that at all. And this datum model, these hierarchy of YAML files can be also used, of course, as an input for your group policies. And then you have a Azure DevOps pipeline that is taking the data and creating the policies or changing the policies as they already exist. So you put group policies in source control, right? Actually, you can put everything in source control that has an API or some layer to talk to it. And nowadays, all our products do. Good. One last chance. No. Something wrong. Good. Any other questions? Please. Uh, I guess. So, is this Azure ID? Yes, then you should. Um, so the question is, what can I manage? And actually, I must confess, I have not an overview about all the um, resources available. So in this case, we should get here. And what is was the exact question? The exact resource? I'm specifically looking for Jim's service management and analytics for I guess so. Yeah. Authentication method policy. Does this ring a bell? Role settings. So as you see, a lot of things do pop up, and uh, just so I can't answer the, the specific question, but just have a look into the resources. It's also growing, and if you are missing some very important piece, then just create an issue, a kind of feature request, and um, then the team around Nick Chalbois in, in Canada, who's maintaining the module, is usually picking it up and creating the resources, right? So um, this project gets, got a lot of more traction because more and more customers have the demand of managing their tenants in a, in a DevOps world, and therefore, I think not, not only the community, but also Microsoft is putting some effort in keeping these things up to date, right? Any other question? Good. So we started this project in 2022 with um, three major customers in Germany. Now a Swiss customer is onboarding as well. So this project is growing. The documentation, as with all these kind of projects, is not as it should be, right? So if we he go here to the to the main page of the workshop, uh, this is M365 DSC workshop. Here it is, right? So we have some simple explanations. Um, um, and also the flowchart. But what we are going to do is we are also providing a lab setup automation. So all you need then is one, two, three tenants that you can control and you can play with. And then we have a couple of scripts that are creating the um, Azure DevOps organization, creating the worker, creating the identity. Of course, some steps have to be done manually, but you get a, a kind of basic setup and then you can test this solution by your own if it makes sense and if you are okay with the look and feel and the overall procedure, right? Documentation is not ready yet, but it should be in... Um, in July, August, because I don't want to repeat myself all the time when a new customer is interested in this. So, yeah, I better document all the stuff. So that should make it easier for me as well. 
Good. That's it in a nutshell, right? Usually it's much more, but um, if you if you are interested in this and you think that things could be making your life easier, as I mentioned, the principles are all the same. So we have this other workshop here, the DSC workshop in the DSC community. This one. And here we have a bunch of exercises. And these exercises, first of all, give you an idea about the very basic principles about DSC that you may know already. And then task number two is focusing all around configuration data. So how can we add a new node? In, in your case, it would be a new build agent for a new Azure tenant. How can we create or how can we implement um, new resources? How can we manage the configuration, add, remove layers? So this is all covered here. And if you are relatively new to DevOps and release pipelines, then exercise number three guides you through setting up the release pipeline and yeah, and getting a feeling about how, how things work. This is for on-prem, for node management, or not on-prem, but it's for node management, for server management, either in the cloud, regardless which cloud it is, or on-prem. But the principles are the same, right? Usually we don't care if we manage, as I said, Jan Hendrik's group policy stuff, or nodes or Azure tenants. It's just something that we want to configure. And we just need to understand how we can configure something with a hierarchical configuration data model. And this is what all these exercises explain. Good. That's it. If there are any questions, um, otherwise, thank you for listening and um, just watch out for the project to evolve over the next couple of months.